Strength is so much more than a physical characteristic. We're talking about a strength when it comes to our convictions, a strength when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the way that we think, our disciplined mind. Strength of character. You know, I've done a couple of Tough Mudders and uh, a couple of uh, Spartan races. And if you're looking to draw a metaphor on life, you, can, you can't go further than them. You know, when it goes through the electrical currents and being shocked by what's around you. When it comes to uh, going into a big skip full of icy cold water. When it's going through a, a big hole full of mud. Hey, you can get so much out of that. During this next month of March, as a church, we will be bringing you a new series focused on how to be men of strength, men of integrity, men of valor, men of honor. We will be seeking to inspire men to be the examples of honesty, truth, and courage, what God has called them to. In a world that is in, that increasingly feels unstable and insecure, we'll seek to inspire men to live lives of commendable character, to be those who impact and influence society as never before. This new series will seek to address some of our own insecurities, our fears, our doubts, to challenge and inspire us to be the kind of men that the Bible encourages us to be. To be brave in dealing with our personal constraints and the things that hold us back. We believe that courage is contagious, that when brave men take a stand, it stiffens the spines of those around them as well. In this series, we will seek to encourage men also to have the courage to open up and to talk to others about the things going on in their lives. You know, the strong, silent type, not good for your emotional health. We live in a society that tells a stark and frightening statistic. In the UK alone, men are three times as likely to die by suicide as women. The rate of death amongst under 25s has increased by 23.7% and in the UK, the highest suicide, remains, suicide rate remains men aged 45 to 49. We need to do what we can to explore the reason for this alarming statistic and do what we can do to help. In this series, we will discover not only how to become better ourselves, but how to do better in the way that we relate to those around us, to understand the impact a few good men can have in the lives of colleagues and friends. We want to use this series to explore the tricky topics of fatherhood. Now, we're not gonna go through some really in, uh, long and engaged uh, uh, biblical treatise on this subject, but we live in a world that profoundly lacks fathers and father figures. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14 to 17, it puts it this way. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He says, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ or teachers, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere and in every church. Note, Paul is saying you have not had many fathers. The responsibility of Paul to be a father to a generation is being highlighted in this passage of scripture. Note his son in the faith, Timothy. Now, Timothy wasn't his real son. Timothy was his son in the faith. He says, when I send Timothy to you, he will teach you to remind you of a way of living in Christ. The millennial generation that surrounds us today is called the fatherless generation, and for good reason. But we believe that we can make a difference as spiritual father figures to those who would otherwise lack that voice of affirmation, direction, and encouragement in their lives. The series is designed to inspire some to find healing over their broken and damaged relationships with earthly fathers, to discover the power of forgiveness and determine to live differently. This series will inspire you to walk and live with integrity as you relate to women in your lives, whether they're mothers, sisters, girlfriends, and wives. This series will motivate you to be a good boyfriend, a great husband, an awesome dad, and a wonderful grandpa. For the women of our church, we hope to set the standards and set the standards biblically high. You can expect these characteristics from the men in your life and from the men in your church to see God's true intention for masculinity in our modern world. This series will help both men and women to understand the power of honesty and integrity and honor, placing value on each other, this series will especially inspire men to develop character above all things. To see in scripture, not the toxic brand of masculinity sold by a world bankrupt of values, morals and ethics, but discover all that Jesus exemplified when it comes or when it came to being a man. This will not be a 
critical or negative thing. There'll, there'll be no man-hating. Um, we're not going to be slapping guys around and making them feel condemned or guilty. But we will seek through this, this series to encourage and inspire the discovery of what the Bible says about being a few good men. This series will motivate you to live your best life. It will encourage you to live a life worthy of the name Jesus. We will inspire you to run your race, to stop comparing yourself with others, to seek to fulfill your destiny, to discover your uniqueness, and allow God to mold and work on your personality. This is a series to free you from toxic behavior and to encourage you to be a strong man, strong in integrity, strong, courageous, brave in character, to discover what it means to be a good man, to see the impact of a few good men, and what that impact can be on the world around us. You're not going to want to miss this series. Well, good evening. We're very excited about this opportunity that we have to share with you around this theme of a few good men. Thank you, Pastor Tom, for explaining what this is all about. And Andy, I think it's a great privilege for you to be able to stand up with here with me tonight as we underpackage this topic. Hang on a second, Phil. Well, we're going to be talking about modern masculinity. What better example could you ask for to share the stage with than... I think you've got this horribly wrong. I think I was asked to be here because I was the perfect example. Well, I don't mean to be rude, Andy, but I'm, 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 I'm taller, I'm, uh, I'm wiser, I'm in maybe slightly better shape. Wow, okay, Phil, I know that you're proud of your running, but let's be honest, the only thing that's running right now is your makeup, because... <laughs> I don't know, but how many men in here put on makeup? Any, anyone? Just you, Phil. It's, it's interesting that you mention running, Andy, because obviously I, I ran a, a half marathon last year, and I can't know the last time you ran... The last time you ran. <laughs> I saw a picture of you at football. I thought that some random person just wandered onto the pitch. Wow. Okay, Phil, just don't get too excited, because we wouldn't want you to break your knee again. <laughs> I mean, if you were to go and break your knee, we might need to get Helena to come and fix it because we know she does all the fixing in the house. <laughs> DIY, Phil, it's changing a light bulb. It's not that hard. Okay, okay, no, that's fair enough. My wife does the DIY around our house because we are a 21st century family, Andy, but it's not like I need my wife to do my hair. Honestly, Phil, I don't think I know any other man that just talks as much as you. Like, just talk, like, can someone go and tell kids team that Phil's on stage, so it might be a little bit later, because you just talk and talk and talk and talk. Well, Andy, it's interesting you mention that, because you've been keeping it short for years. Oh, oh, oh. still talking there, Phil. I'm... Right, enough, enough talk. If you are had enough of talk, this isn't working. We're just going to end up completely ruining our platform before we speak. So let's settle what this. What do you want to do? Let's settle it. Let's settle it with an arm wrestle. Oh, an arm wrestle. Yeah. Okay, let's do this. Come on. So we're going to need you guys to count down from three. Are you le right-handed or left-handed? Left-handed. Okay, well let's use our right arm. <laughs> So we need to count now. Three, two, one, and then go, and then we go, okay? draw we'll finish it in the atrium later <laughs> like men 
I don't think this is working. I think we should go and ask these good people where Maybe we can find a better idea. some inspiration. Andy, watch you don't fall off this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you guys think? What would be your example of a man, like an ideal man, someone that you look up to? Dave, do you have an idea? Who would be someone, a man, that you would look up to? Uh, we had a good one in Ipswich this morning, Mufasa. Great. Mufasa the Lion. Yeah, Mufasa from the Lion King. Uh, I said it was Lily that suggested it. I said she could take great pride in that answer. Hey. It's not the main thing we're going to be talking about tonight, but I think she can. I'd be lying if I told you it was uh, the main thing we're going to talk about. Oh. Some of you aren't there yet. We'll just pause while you catch up. <laughs> anyone else? Any ideas? Has anyone got a suggestion of who's a man that you can look up to? We got Jess. Okay, Jess. Aslan from Narnia. It's not all. It's not all lions. <laughs> can we get off the lions? And if anyone can manage a third lion, men. I mean, I will <laughs> buy you a coffee. But uh, anyone else that you could look up to that's like a, a human person? <laughs> We've got Nikki over here. Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Nelson that's Mandela. a good one. That's a good example. That's a very good. I one. heard one shouted from over here. <laughs> Um, Dumbledore. Dumbledore. I don't think this is working out, Andy. Once we get onto witchcraft, I'm not sure we're going along the right lines. So we tried, we decided to have a think about this ourselves, and we tried to think of some great examples of people that we could look up to, and you know, examples of modern masculinity. Um, and we're probably going to need our notes. Well, <laughs> I don't know about you, but what about footballers? Yeah. Or sportsmen, like great sportsmen. I mean, we thought about them. People who have achieved the highest level of, uh, I guess, sporting prowess, who've achieved incredible skill, incredible talent in that area. I mean, sportsmen may be people that we could look up to, but to be honest, they don't all live ideal lives. How many times have we heard of footballers that have been embroiled in, in scandals, things that have affected their family life? They may be great people to look up to in a sporting sense, but are they great people that are role models for family? It's actually a picture of Dave made. We just photoshopped. <laughs> it's Ronaldo's face on Dave's body. That's, just, that's what that is. That was uh, Monday Night Football when it got a little bit over emotional. What? <laughs> it's just like looking in the mirror of a morning. But for even footballers, Andy, you know, that like. We can't necessarily get, because I mean, like, when it comes to even the ones that are good family mm. men, like, financially, it's hard to look up to a footballer, isn't it? Yeah. Because they've just got so much money that it's hard for us to kind of, you know, follow their example, I think. Mm -hmm. So I, I was thinking about some other examples, like, we thought about, you know, social media influencers, for example, like YouTubers, like, like this guy. Logan Paul, does anyone know this guy? Anyone know him? So he's a, yeah, exactly. You can tell from the response, right? He's a hugely successful YouTuber, but there's a lot of controversy about the content that he puts online. And, you know, you might look at people on Instagram, you know, that there are others who have achieved much success on Instagram, but what can we learn from these men? You know, because some people are great examples of just how to look good on Instagram. Oh, no, how did that, no, did no, that come from? no, 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 take that one down. Take that one down. There we go, that's, that's better. But you know, these guys who look good on Instagram, like what can we really learn? We can learn how to look good and how to leverage looking good to make it in life, but what else can we learn? So we thought perhaps we could look at thinkers, you know, people who are really, really smart, like Professor Brian Cox, the physicist. Again, hugely influential, but can anyone hope to be that smart? Yeah. And does he actually provide answers beyond the intellectual? Does he help us find meaning as well as information? I mean, others might provide both. Like, for example, Jordan Peterson, the Canadian psychologist. He's an author and a, a public speaker as well. And he has a podcast that has millions of listeners. He sells out arenas all across the world. Yet, Peterson has become the poster boy for some... I guess you could call them less than savory followers too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you go looking for what it means to be a man on the internet, it isn't long before you end up in a pretty dark place. I mean, mm -hmm. has anyone heard of, um, of the group that, of incels? 
Have you heard of this? Incels, these are people that are short for involuntary celibates. And the, the definition is a group of men who define themselves as unable to find a romantic or sexual partner despite wanting one. Mm. And when you read their views, you understand why they're struggling. Honestly, because... <laughs> No, like they are uh, misogynistic, they're full mm. of self-pity, self-loathing, and, and yet with this overwhelming sense of entitlement. And actually that's what happens when you go looking on the internet for what does it mean to be a man. It's not long before you end up in this place of toxic masculinity. Yeah, and I mean this week has been a stark reminder of that. With Harvey Weinstein found guilty of rape and criminal sexual assault and then sentenced... What has been exposed is this failing of a, of a leading executive in the media world that failed to protect or even to respect people that worked under him. We see the failing of an entire social circle as well that failed to stand up to these atrocities until they were finally brought to light in the Me Too movement. We see how this brand of male dominance allowed great, horrible crime to go unpunished for yeah. so long. And when faced with all of these examples of masculinity, it can cause us to wonder, well, what does it actually look like to be mm. a man? You know, media and popular culture prevent, present us at best with an incomplete picture of what it means to be a man, and at worst, with this picture of a man that can be corrupted or perverse or just wrong. Mm. So what is it that makes up a man? Is it brute strength? Is it a, a dominant personality? Is it the ability to rise to the top, to be the alpha male that's better than everyone else? Is it intellect? to be able to use your intelligence to lead people and make things happen? Is it how smart you are that forms this basis of the ideal 21st century man? Yeah, where can we find a standard for modern day masculinity? Well, actually, we want to suggest today that, you know, while our modern world does offer us some examples, we're actually better off looking backwards, looking to some ancient mm. examples. And, and that's what we're going to do over the course of this series. Because the Bible offers us some great examples of what masculinity can look like. And we're going to take some time to explore them. You might wonder what value we can find there, you know, especially if you're someone that wouldn't call yourself a Christian, especially if you're not someone that's normally found in church. But we'd encourage you to come with us on the journey because the examples we're going to explore have stood the test of time. Mm. And if we struggle to find an example in our modern world that really matches up, to what we're looking for, maybe we can find something in these ancient examples instead. Yeah, when it comes to trying to find out what it means to be a man, today we're going to examine the example of David's mighty men. David was one of the greatest kings of Israel, and he was responsible for uniting the entire kingdom. David achieved many great things, and you know, all of these are recorded in the Bible, but there's special mention in multiple accounts of the mighty men, about 30 key men that were significant in his military, but also achieved great feats. In 2 Samuel 23, it says that these are the men, or these are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb Bashabeth, a Tekemonite. I'm so glad you got this bit to read. <laughs> he was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter continues. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai the Ahahite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines, gathered at Pastam in for battle. And then the Israelites retreated, but Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. After the arm wrestle, I kind of know how that feels. <laughs> it says, the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. Next to him was Shammah, son of Agi, the Hararite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came to David at the cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of the Rephaim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? And David would not drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. We see in these examples much that we can admire and much to which we can aspire as well. 
Here are three men and others who are listed in the verses that come next, but three men who fought with great might, whose exploits found themselves a place in the history books alongside King David. But what can we learn from these men? Because I don't think many of us are going to find ourselves in battle with 800 warriors or facing Philistines or even protecting a field. I mean, we know that the the examples here are military victories. But when you take a minute to look at it, you realize that it was more than just skill Mm -hmm. that enabled these men to achieve their victories. For behind every fight they won or army they fought off, there is something far deeper that propelled them to victory. It was more than just them being good at swinging a sword around or poking people with a spear. They also possessed a character that facilitated victories far greater than that of the others around them. It was not just their fighting prowess that set them apart. It was their character. Here were men of courage and valor, of dedication and determination, of passion and perseverance. They were men prepared to stand up for what they believed in, to fight for what mattered, men of honor, prepared to offer their lives in service to their king, to put their lives on the line, to even just help fulfill the longing of his heart. Yeah. We want to suggest today that when it comes to being men, character Mm. is what really counts. You know, that there are lots of people that we could look to for inspiration, that there are lots of ingredients that we could consider, but what goes beyond them all is character. Mm. The character is what counts. That's what you see in the lives of these men. You know, there were probably many great swordsmen in Israel. There were probably many men in David's army that were good with a spear, but what set them apart was their character. It says that when everyone else ran away, they stayed and fought. It says that their lives were defined by not giving up, that they were attentive even to the the whispers of David's heart. They were honoring of their leader. They were men who showed their courage when others fled, who were attentive. It was their character that set them apart. And we often think that in order to be successful, we need to work on our skills. If only we can get better at writing or playing that sport or get fitter or improve our ability in whatever area it is, then we'll find success in life. But how many times have we seen talented people who messed up, not because they lacked the ability, but because of the content of their character? This is a very real danger especially in a world that celebrates a certain kind of success and that owns in on a a very superficial sense of what it means to do well. There is a danger that our talent elevates us to a level where our character cannot keep us. To put it another way, it may be our gift that opens the door, but it's our character that keeps us in the room. Our gifts or our talents, they may provide us with short-term successes, but it is character That's what leads to long-term significance and impact and influence. Yeah. And this is something that we see in the life of the man that these warriors gathered around in David. You know, David was Israel's mightiest king, but he wasn't born into royalty. He was raised as a humble shepherd and then anointed as king. Why? Well, was it his military prowess, his good looks and charisma? Well, David certainly possessed these things, but that was not the defining factor. The prophet Samuel outlines the reason why David was chosen in 1 Samuel 13. Words that echo in the New Testament in Acts. It says, The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him as ruler of the people. In other words, it was the content of David's character that set him apart. He had a heart after God's heart. Pursued that which God valued. Sought to reflect God in a way that he lived his life. Indeed, this is underlined three chapters later as God affirms David's appointment to Samuel. In 1 Samuel 16, it says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David was by no means perfect, but he was consistently committed to working on his character. He was known for diligently caring for sheep long before he stood up for Israel. He fought and killed Goliath, a giant, out of a sense of honor and duty to God, not for his own fame. As his fame did spread, he had a chance to usurp the king, but he chose not to do so out of honor and respect. I mean, even when David went astray, which he did in spectacular fashion, he provides an example of character coming back to God in repentance and asking for forgiveness. 
You know, David's life is a case study in the impact and influence of character. Because it was his character that most set him apart. You know, we can think sometimes that life responds to the things that we do. But we want to suggest to you that who you are counts more. Yeah. That life responds more to who you are than to what you do. I remember hearing uh, Paul Scanlon, who's a pastor from the north of England, say something along these lines years ago. And the power of those words has stuck with me in so many situations. You might actually want to write it down. Life responds more to who you are than to what you do. And this truth, it's apparent throughout David's life. Time and again, he experiences impact and influence that comes from his character far more than it does from his skill or his talent. And that same sense of importance of character is apparent too in the men that we see drawn to him. Yeah. Mighty men flocked to him because he was a mighty man. He drew others like him to himself, as we all do. Yeah. Indeed, if you want to know what your character looks like, why don't you take a look at who's in your world? Yeah, the people that are around you will reflect mm. your character. Mm. And we see the influence too, not only of David on those who gathered around him, but also of those who gathered around him in their world. Elsewhere in the Bible, in 1 Chronicles, it talks also of the mighty men, and this one tells of their influence. It says that they were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors, and they, together with all Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land, as the Lord had promised. Their influence spread across the whole land. If we want to find true influence, character is what counts. The character counts in every situation. You know, while skill or talent may influence one area of life, our character influences everything that we do. So if life responds more to who you are than to what you do, then shouldn't we spend more time developing our character? To explore a little bit more about what that looks like, we're going to look again at the example of these men, these mighty men. And while we can't explore every aspect of character, we can look at three key areas in the hopes that we will be able to develop our own character through this. I think the first thing is determination. Yeah. One of the things that strikes me the most about these feats that were achieved by these mighty men is the way that they had the determination to persevere even when things were at their most difficult and were so obviously against them. For example, when we look at Eleazar, and how he kept on fighting to the point that his hand became so tired it stuck to the sword, you realize just how far they were willing to go. Yeah. And in the same way that Eleazar was willing to, to stand his ground despite the odds against him, I think it is essential that we are willing to stand our ground when things get difficult, when we face challenges or things get tough. It is so easy to allow ourselves to just give up. But it's the greatest achievements that require us to overcome the greatest obstacles. Yeah. When things get tough, we need to be tougher. We need to keep on going. But it's not just when things are tough. Sometimes the most important times for us to have this determination is when we are faced with the regular, the mundane, the usual, the things that happen all the time. It's choosing to be diligent when you're stuck in that job that you don't actually like. It's choosing to keep on persevering with the boring bits of your university course. It's deciding that even those things that you have to do on a regular basis, you're going to do them well. Yeah, you, you can't cut corners mm. when it comes to character. Uh, and this sense of determination, well, how can we actually practically put that into practice in our lives? Well, we, we find a great example from another of the mighty men. You pronounced that really well earlier, Andy. Josheb Bassebeth. Almost. So he killed 800 men with a spear. How do you kill 800 men? I'll tell you, one at a time. <laughs> so actually, we laugh. But that's the way that we can start to put deter determination into practice in our lives. One at a time. One step at a time. One decision at a time. And actually, I think we should make that a motto for ourselves for, for this week. Just one more. What would it look like to do just one more? In whatever area you need to develop determination, do just one more. Mm. If we were talking about this in the gym, if we were talking about in the... Uh, I won't explain it to you. But if we were in the gym and we were talking about what this might look like, it might be like doing just one more rep or just one more minute. I don't know what it might look like for you. Maybe that is the area you need to develop. Or maybe it's about just giving one more minute of attention to your study or, or one more hour. Maybe it's about having one more 
challenging conversation. Maybe it's, you know, making one more effort with that person that you've been struggling with. One more effort at reconciliation with that person you've become disconnected from. What might it look like to do just one more? I don't know what it looks like, but the key is that incremental increase. You know, pushing it a little bit further every day. Because character doesn't change overnight. You know, we cannot reshape our personality on one good decision. Mm -hmm. It takes consistency and time to bring out Mm -hmm. that change. But that's why it's important to set that achievable aim. This one thing, one area where we could take one next step outside of our comfort zone. And those steps of perseverance will develop Mm. determination in us. But to help us with this, you might need a bit of accountability. I'm aware that David's mighty men, they did not fight in isolation. They found support among their peers. And though they may not have had one another alongside each other in every situation, they knew they could rely on each other. So maybe you just need to share that just one more goal with someone else. Text someone else. Tell someone else. Just make sure you're accountable to someone else for that just one more goal. Yeah, I think that's so powerful because even though they weren't necessarily there in the moment, even though Eliezer was on his own in that field, he knew the standard of the people he did life with. He knew what they aspired to and actually he knew that 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 was the standard he wanted to live his life Mm -hmm. to and it's so helpful to have people that we can draw on for support. So the first aspect of character that we can see in David's mighty men is determination. The second? Courage. Another striking character that we see in David's mighty men is the courage that they possessed. The way that Shammah stood up to defend the lentil fields when all the other Israelites fled reveals just how courageous he was. Did you say a lentil field? Yeah. Maybe he was a vegan. <laughs> to be fair, sounds Have we got right. any vegans in? So how do you know? He, uh, we, we thought about this. You can tell he isn't a vegan. How do you know he isn't a vegan? Because it doesn't tell you he's a vegan. And if he was a vegan, he definitely would have told them he was a vegan. Somebody, I said that in Ipswich. And somebody texted me and went, just like someone who's a doctor. (laughs) So thank you, Simon Cutler, for the moment of uh, insight and reflection that you allowed me. Anyway, Andy. (laughs) I believe that regardless of where you might find yourself, it is important in all situations to be courageous. In today's society, that might often look like standing up for something that you believe in. We show courage as we speak out against injustice, especially in situations when we may be standing alone. I mean, for example, if a group of men are speaking in a derogatory manner against a woman, it is important as a man to be willing to stand up and speak against that, even if it means that you're going against what everyone else is saying. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, you know, courage is the, is the willingness to stand up and do that which scares us. To feel the fear and do it anyway. And what is it that scares us? I mean, it probably isn't a field full of Philistines. But actually, what might scare us might be standing up or standing out. As, as Andy mentioned, you know, someone was saying to me this morning in Ipswich, they wish their colleagues could hear this because they need someone to stand up against the misogynistic culture that has developed in their workplace. And they wish that someone was prepared to stand up. And as men, we sometimes are scared of standing up and standing out. But maybe that's the fear we need to face. Maybe there's another fear that we need to face. Maybe it's the fear of taking responsibility. Maybe there are areas of our life that we need to take responsibility. Maybe there's broken relationships that we need to take responsibility for mending. Maybe it's our financial situation and we've been running away from addressing it. But we need to take hold of that issue. You know, maybe, maybe it's just initiating a conversation with someone that's ignored. Maybe there's just someone in your workplace that no one ever talks to. That actually maybe what it looks like to show courage is just to go up and speak to that person. To start a conversation, to, to eat your lunch with them. You know, it, it, it's easy to put these decisions off to another time or to lead them to someone else. But courage is taking on those challenges. And just as we have that just one more response to develop determination... Maybe there's another one thing here. What's one thing that you could do this week that scares you? What's one thing? One thing that you need to stand up for. One tricky conversation that you need to have. One area that maybe you've been avoiding. Maybe it's time to take that on. And again, accountability can be so valuable. You don't have to go it alone. If there's one thing that you need to do to develop determination, maybe you want to share with someone 
that one thing that you need to take on, that one thing that scares you. Maybe you want to ask someone to pray for you as you take it on. So the first characteristic is determination, and the second is courage. The third? I think it's selflessness. The third characteristic that we see in this account is of the men that heard David wishing out loud for a drink of water from the gate near Bethlehem. These men responded to David's whispered utterance by breaking through the enemy lines just so they could fulfill David's desire. These men, they were willing to serve David regardless of the cost to themselves, even if it meant giving up their own life. This speaks of honor. It speaks of attentiveness, but it also speaks of selflessness. They were prepared to risk their lives to make David's life better. When we think of character or what a great man should be, I wonder if we look to see if he is willing to serve. Is he willing to put others before himself? Do we, as men, have the humility to actually serve others? Are we willing to sacrifice our time, our energy, our whatever it might be? Are we willing to sacrifice that for the good of someone else? This then is our third practical piece of application. As well as taking one more step that develops determination, as well as doing one more thing that scares us, what's one way that we could show selflessness in action this week? What's one thing that I could do for someone else? You know, it might be at work, it might be at home, it might be that tonight you want to decide to start volunteering in church. But, but what's one thing that we could do that is no direct benefit for us, but that will help someone else? And, you know, this third point it may not actually be the first thing that we think of when we consider what makes a man. I mean, determination and courage, they're pretty obvious, right? But selflessness, selflessness, this may actually be the most significant of them all. We see this selflessness in these mighty men, yet there is an even more powerful example that actually comes from David's lineage, and that's of Jesus. Yeah. You know, as the band join us on stage, Jesus is the finest mm. example of true masculinity. The Son of God who stepped out of heaven to walk on this earth. Jesus, who came to teach us of God, to show us God, and to show us what a relationship with God could be like. Jesus, who came not only to show us that relationship, but to make it possible for us to know God personally ourselves, who, through his death and resurrection, made it possible for each of us to approach God with confidence and boldness and to expect his goodness and favor in our lives. Jesus lived out all of these areas that we've spoken of tonight, but perhaps it is his selflessness that stands out. Jesus willingly offered his life in our place. Though all things were created in him, through him, and for him, he surrendered his life, first to the frailty of human form, then he gave up his life for us, to take away all the junk that should separate us from God. This was the ultimate selfless act, giving his life to bring us back to God. Jesus was very intentional about hardwiring that same sense of selflessness into the pattern of our lives. At dinner one evening, for example, as it tells us in John 13, Jesus knelt to wash the feet of his disciples. Now, this was entirely unheard of. For the teacher to wash the feet of his followers, Jesus is making a point. He says as much himself about how we should serve one another. And so selflessness is key if we are to fully develop our character. And so too is our relationship with Jesus. While our focus tonight has been on David and his mighty men, Jesus is the even greater example. While David was a man after God's own heart, Jesus is God. While David slipped up at times, Jesus lived a spotless, sinless life. In Jesus, we find another key characteristic, and that's of integrity. Jesus demonstrated impeccable integrity from his first day until his death and as he rose again. He always did what he said he would, always lived by the values that he taught, determined, courageous, selfless, and true to his word in every single step, even when it would cost him everything. And while David and his mighty men are dead and gone, leaving only their example, Jesus still lives today. His presence is with us now. While David and his mighty men may inspire us, Jesus empowers us to live lives of godly character. He promises that he will send his Holy Spirit to equip us and enable us. He promises that he will be with us. He walks with us through the ups and downs of life. To live these lives that we've spoken of, lives of determination and courage and of selflessness, 
It may seem challenging. It may even seem impossible. Yet Jesus can empower us to live just this kind of life. He is strength when we feel weak. He's power when we feel impotent. He is the peace we need to persevere. It's his example that inspires courage. He breeds confidence and boldness into our bones. We won't find the strength we need on our own resolve alone. We will find it when we come to Jesus. It's in Jesus we find all that we need to become the men and the women that God has called us to be. Our world needs real men to stand up. Men of determination, of courage, selfless men with the integrity to live out what they believe. Society needs men of character to influence culture, to protect the most vulnerable, to speak out against injustice and to build a brighter future for our world. It needs men who are prepared to set the standard, to revive noble values and to place fresh emphasis on what matters most. We find a fine example in David and his mighty men, don't we? But Jesus sets an even higher standard. Yet he empowers us to live just that kind of life. And imagine what would happen if we rose up on our inside, if we set our hearts on becoming people of good character. What difference could we make in our world? How would our lives be different? What might that do for our family and our friends? How would that change our workplaces, our schools, our universities? It is time for a new generation of mighty men and women to arise. Should we pray? Would you stand with us tonight? I feel like this is a moment for some people to make a decision, to make a response. We're going to sing the words that we sang a little bit earlier in just a moment. But before we do, maybe you need to commit yourself to live out one or more of the characteristics that we've just spoken about. To be men of determination, of courage, of selflessness, to have the integrity to live out what we say we believe. I believe that we find the strength to do it in Jesus, that the standard is set so high we could never achieve it on our own, but with his power in our lives, there is no limit to what we can achieve. So across this room, men, women, would you reach out your hands if that is you and you're saying, let me be a person of character, a mighty man, a woman who makes a difference in my world. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that your word contains the example of David and his mighty men. That though they not, were not perfect, they provide us with great examples of character. That David, even though he slipped up and failed, he shows us how life responds more to who we are than to what we do. We thank you that you're one who promotes the shepherd boy, who raises up the humble, who empowers worshipers to make a difference in their world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that you came to make it possible for us to know you, that through you we can know relationship with God, that your strength and power can be breathed into our lives. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to get right with God on our own strength or own ability, but that you have paved the way for that relationship and out of the strength of knowing God we can live lives of determination lives of courage selfless lives that make a difference in our world so we stand tonight prepared to take just one more step of determination prepared this week to do just one thing that scares us prepared committed to doing one selfless act and believing that we would start a journey that we would not perhaps be transformed in a moment but that this would be the first moment of a journey toward the kind of character that really counts the kind of character that would change our world for the glory of your name amen okay thank you for joining us uh, for this YouTube video presentation of our latest ministry we hope you really enjoyed it and if you did why don't you subscribe to our channel Better still, send us some feedback. If you have questions, let us know. We'd be more than happy to interact and engage with you. Thank you again, and we hope that you will join us soon. Why not try and make it to one of our services one Sunday? We're meeting here in Norwich from 10.30 a.m. and then again at 5 p.m. at night. We'd love to see you. God bless you.